The Circulate project explores the certain tensions that arise when new technologies, and in this case, distributed ledger technologies, are implemented in resource communities. Resource communities are groups of people who are sharing resources, and in some cases, resources that they produce and also use communally. And these could be um, ranging from energy to mobility networks. The reason that we're looking at these communities now is that we see them emerging all over the Netherlands. So it's definitely a new uh, phenomena that we think is not going to end anytime soon. The people living in a, a resource community face the very concrete problem of managing and checking who uses which uh, resources. And of course, considering that blockchain these days is very en vogue, so to say, we wanted to explore whether this kind of technology is a good fit for this problem space. One of the aspects that we look into is the implementation of technology and whether technology can be considered a neutral medium. When we implement these kinds of technologies in communities, we seem to think that they won't have any effect besides the facilitation of uh, managing systems. But actually, they bring along with them a certain number of values that create tensions in these neighborhoods. And we don't really know what these tensions will lead to in terms of a possible deterioration of social relationships. This is the reason why we develop a methodology and a series of design tools uh, that can be used by resource communities uh, to tease out the kind of values that they want to put in these technologies. And they will end up shaping the way in which they live in the future with this technology. So the role of digital technologies within energy communities is a tricky thing to touch upon because, of course, nowadays we have the tendency to just throw technology at every problem we have and expect that the digital systems uh, are going to solve uh, whatever. In reality, these, energy, these communities, not necessarily only energy communities, are uh, first and foremost uh, social groups of people and potentially, conceptually, they could track their energy use or their resource use also with a whiteboard and a marker. Okay, so it's not uh, fundamentally um, a digital issue. Schoon Schip is, we call it, the most sustainable, floating, self-sufficient neighborhood in Europe. And that's a community of 50 households that we also supported in unifying them as a group and building the sense of community, building the social network to be strong enough to take a professional position in taking charge of the development themselves. What I find it important in the work that we did with Circulate is that we explored the limits and the possibilities of what can be done uh, with digital technology and especially with uh, digital ledgers and the blockchain. And we uh, formulated some recommendations and some dilemmas uh, that really poke at uh, what should and maybe should not uh, be, be, be done. The Circulate project was an opportunity to collaborate with and the knowledge department of uh, HVA and partners also uh, participating in the Circulate and because it has an academic background as well as a practical background. And of course, from the practical implementation, we bump into hypothetical questions. What is the threshold of a community to develop itself? And where does actually the individual and the sense of individualism is being taken over by the sense of community? So how does that relate to privacy? Uh, one of the big promises of blockchain for resource communities is its very transparency. Uh, it can make visible to the community as a whole uh, who has what kind of resource, who has used what kind of resource, who has produced, who has contributed, etc. So transparency could really help a resource community to sort of manage themselves. And for a resource community, that's potentially a good thing. However, of course, all that transparency comes at the cost of the privacy of the individual people. You could have a system, for instance, where a priority is given based on a particular need, right? So we both book a car at the same moment. Uh, I did it first, but you need it because you want to go to, you need to go to the doctor for an emergency thing. But how much of that would you need to share with me, right? Would you need to share with me that you're going to the doctor? Is that that's why you need that car, for instance? Or should that left be, be left private, right? So you see that 
um, you need to give up some sort of privacy uh, in the negotiation because you need to tell me that you need it a lot, but maybe you don't need to tell me everything, right? And then for every system or for every community, I think this balance between what do you make private, what do you make transparent, is one of the design dilemmas. There is no good or wrong. Uh, it's a matter of finding sort of the right spot in the spectrum for the right group. We want to facilitate the building process of building strong, close-knit communities. But we can also incentivize um, the operational phase of it. If you do car sharing, there is good behavior, there is bad behavior. Quality of the built environment should go up while the cost go down to make it inclusive and affordable for everybody to take part. But there's always operational cost in the upkeep of uh, well, shared mobility or shared gardens or shared collective space. So then you strongly depend on the behavior of people. How do you use this space? How do you use the car? Because if there's lots of maintenance, there will be lots of maintenance cost. So if we can, let's say, train individuals or can expect good behavior from community members, it will reduce maintenance cost. But what can you give in return for good behavior? It's not something obvious. So we started imagining a commune, commune IT, which is a token in the community that can be traded. Good behavior is rewarded. And there's a time bank um, also uh, the energy trading is tokenized, maybe good behavior could be tokenized. But already at the moment of thinking through this tokenization, what might be the dark side of just this? Does it enhance good behavior or does it actually enhance like capitalist behavior that you only perform good behavior in return for a few tokens? So that's where we started acknowledging the aspect of, okay, we can incentivize good behavior, but does it eventually uh, distance us from the goal we want to achieve? So the dilemma of social versus economic benefits uh, deals with the way that uh, people are rewarded or with the motivation that people have uh, to participate in a particular system. So you could optimize a system for economic benefits, right? And then uh, that would work in a situation where people are very much um, interested in reaping uh, yeah, economic rewards. Uh, that could be uh, a profit because they sell energy directly to the market. Uh, it could also be in an internal exchange that if I contribute uh, a number of hours of voluntary work, I get actually a reward in terms of points or credits that I can spend on an other resource. On the other hand, you could also optimize a system or organize it that people get rewarded socially, uh, to be rewarded by the community for their contributions to a community. Uh, one example we found in our literature study is that if you look at, um, at energy communities, then there are a lot of people who are motivated to participate in them from an economic perspective, right? They want to save money by having their own energy or they want to sell the energy that they have as a surplus to the market. However, we also found people um, who approach energy differently. Uh, for them, energy was more like uh, an apple tree that they would have in the back of the garden. And when it's September and you have a gazillion of apples, Right? You don't want to sell each apple to the market. You give a bucket of apples to your neighbors or to your parents or to your friends for free. Eh? And in return, they maybe bake you an apple pie or something like that. Eh? So those are two very different ways that you could organize your resources. You could do it in a more social way, like the, the, the apple pie example, or you could do it uh, on a very market and economic based way. So social versus economic eh, is about yeah, how do you value uh, the resources uh, in your system from, from which perspective. So I think one of the most important dilemmas is uh, quantified versus qualified. Uh, because uh, one of the promises of the blockchain and one of the uh, advantages of it is that you can keep track of basically anything that you can quantify, right? You can put sensors everywhere, you can keep logbooks of everything, so you can quantify all kinds of economic, social, cultural, what have you, relations into the blockchain, assign a value to them, and then start exchanging to them. Um, however, that also means that once you start doing that, 
then you start to formalize uh, a lot of behavior into that system. So a lot of things that you may uh, want to, or that you did previously before informally. Uh, I took care of your children. I did some groceries for my neighbor because he or she was sick. Uh, I did it as a human being and I didn't really want to be rewarded for that because I think that's what you do when you live somewhere, right? So at the moment that you start entering those values, uh, which used to be more qualified social relations into the blockchain, into formal relations, these uh, numbers also start to change the way that we as people see each other, that we interact each other. Because now I'm not doing it anymore for you as a neighbor, but I'm doing it because I get five credits for it. And that changes the relation that we have. So yes, you can quantify everything, but no, you should not need to want to quantify everything. Uh, and for each community, again, I think this is very different and it's very important to figure out what do you want to organize officially in a formalized way and which of the things do you think actually it's better if people sort of organize that informally amongst themselves and we leave that off the blockchain outside of the database. <music>
uh, moment when you engage with the system. So it doesn't know the, re the, the time you engage with it, what else might be going on and what else you may want to do or you know, what might be good uh, in that situation. If you build uh, a platform, uh, you can incentivize people to a particular kinds of behavior that you think is for the benefit of the system as a whole. For instance, you can do price differentiation uh, where energy becomes uh, cheaper or more expensive based on the supply. Uh, and that would be an incentive for me to maybe not use the energy at this moment in time. I could get a particular reward for a particular behavior. Uh, could be anything, could be a monetary reward, could be a social reward. Uh, so there are many ways that you can incentivize people for a particular behavior. However, that incentivization can sometimes become manipulation if the system is set up in such a way that it doesn't really give me a choice, right? If there is an incentive, I still feel that I have the agency to say, okay, I see that you're rewarding me with this, but still I don't want it. So the agency is with me. Um, if I take away that agency, then it becomes a bit more manipulating. Um, and uh, manipulating is when it's organized in such a way that people are maybe not even aware that they're being incentivized or not in a particular way, or that they feel that it looks like an uh, incentives, but they don't really have a choice. Uh, for instance, if you look at um, some of the platforms in the gig economy, the way that they are organized right now, uh, if uh, a driver from one of the ride-sharing platforms wants to uh, switch off and say, okay, I want to go home, I want to go back to my family, then that system sends out messages, do you really want to do that? Stay on for an extra hour because you can make this and this and this and this and this much money uh, for the next hour. Yeah? And because also the system as a whole is untransparent, the driver often feels that they don't have a choice because first of all, they don't want to miss out on the opportunity of the reward, but they're also not sure if, that if they say no at that moment, that there won't, will not be any repercussions the next day for how the system will uh, yeah, point particular uh, rights to them or not, right? So there is sort of a threshold where incentivization um, is a powerful force for people to sort of yeah, do things for the common good and they have agency over that. There is also a point where they sort of lose that agency or they're not aware that their behavior is actually manipulated. And I think where most of the design dilemmas are actually a skill when there is no uh, good or bad, I think maybe this one, the manipulation is an aspect that as a designer you want to uh, stay away from. Huh? Unless you are very sure that sort of the behavior that you want to tease out uh, is, uh, yeah, contributes to the common good. But even then, personally, I think it's better to organize it in such a way that people still have agency over that. If there is the necessity to have access to a specific resource, but there is a lack of availability, who's deciding? Is it the individual that's deciding or is it the technology that's deciding? If we believe that the platform or potential algorithms can make these decisions, they cannot. It's the people that have to think through what we want the algorithm to do. And that's the difficult part. Uh, we haven't cracked that nut yet, but at least together with the HVA and in the Circulate Research, we have come very close to specifically articulating this question and the notion that it is a dilemma, that it is a, a thin line between positive effect or dark side effects. Human versus algorithmic governance deals with the question of how decisions in a system uh, are made. Uh, are they made by algorithms or are they made by humans? Uh, and in many ways, uh, people would probably prefer algorithmic governance. Uh, for instance, you could imagine a system where every time a decision needs to be made, uh, the system will send out a message, are you allowed to have the car at this moment or not? Uh, let's vote for that, right? You don't want to do that because that's too much of a hassle. It's really nice to have sort of the algorithms organize a lot of the everyday kind of management of a system. However, the problem with algorithms is they have particular values in them, they are encoded, um, but in such a way that it becomes a yes or a no. Uh, there is hardly any room for interpretation 
there is no room for exceptions. And there are also uh, no algorithms for things that you didn't foresee that could happen at the moment that you uh, programmed the platform. So somewhere in the system, uh, you should have a way where you can say, OK, now let's stop the algorithms. This is where the humans should come in. Uh, that could be maybe once a year. You could say, okay, let's have a meeting once a year in which we sort of revise all the rules. Um, but it could also, in some cases, it could be uh, m maybe there are th things that you want to vote on on a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month kind of basis. Uh, so again, for all the rules that you set in the system, you have to decide, uh, can an algorithm take part of that? Do we need a human in the loop? And if we don't have a human in the loop, what are moments? that we can evaluate that system and change the underlying rules. At the end of this project, I want designers to know that managing a community is way messier than, than it seems. Um, we started this project by assuming that we could design something and deploy that uh, in a way that was fairly painless and we were really confronted with all the um, complication, big and small, of dealing with uh, a live system such as a social community. So designers should be aware that human beings are uh, emotional, they are messy, they have aspirations and values that occasionally are not rational. Uh, sometimes they want to have fun, Sometimes they also want to save the planet and save energy and do all the good things that we should be doing. Uh, but it's not possible and it's not sensible to just optimize from the top down. You also need to deal with the complexity of human nature. And that requires to step away from the rigidity of the algorithms occasionally, which is Odd to say because we are digital designers. In theory, we should be uh, making a system that run on a, on a computer which is as rigid as it gets. But we need to find ways in which we make these things more flexible and in a way more human. So I think for us, the six design dilemmas that we've discovered uh, so far, um, it's just the beginning, right? And there is no way that we think uh, we've made the very definite uh, and the once and for all exhaustive list. Um, I think it's very well possible that uh, if you're working in this space, uh, you will maybe come across some other dilemmas. Uh, or maybe one of the dilemmas is not so interesting for you, uh, the other one is, but maybe there is a particular sub-question uh, that we haven't really thought of ourselves. So we really invite people to see this actually as an open invitation, not only to use our dilemmas as a checklist, but to yeah, continue developing them and filling them in with examples, uh, questions that you can ask around them, maybe adding new dilemmas. Huh? And we hope that this can be the beginning of sort of a growing body of work uh, yeah, on the design of local platforms for uh, resource communities. Thank you.